Hey guys, uh, your buddy Chop It On with a quick video on today's NHL Research Station. Uh, three game slate, not hard to dissect information. We should be able to do this very, very quickly. Uh, I'm going to dive in and show you how I use it. This, there are others, uh, you know, Jim Keenan, the creator, has a tutorial that shows how to use it. Other guys have uh, opinions on how to use it. I'm a minimalist. These are the ways that I use it. I want to show you quickly and then show you another source. As far as as far as how to quickly break down the NHL slate, we've got new guys coming in and out of the room all the time, and this is the easiest way for me to process the information very quickly. Today is a three-game slate. A three-game slate typically is not going to be a cash game slate because that one wild, crazy player somewhere is going to be highly enough owned that if you don't have him, he breaks the slate, and you don't have much of a chance to cash in 50-50s in cash games. Although, that's a little bit over-exaggerated because you still, if you beat the top 50%, you still cash. doesn't matter if it's a showdown slate or a 15,000 game slate. Your goal is just to beat half of the people. The, the issue with the smaller player pools is that more people are on the same players. Therefore, the differences in lineups is very, very small. And that one change here or there makes dramatic swings in that money line, especially that 50-50 line, as far as what side of it you land on. However, what that means also is that when you do hit it right, typically you may not win by more than eight or nine points, but you hit it really, really right compared to everybody else. And that's why it becomes a little bit easier to win GPPs on slates like today, especially if you do have that one guy that breaks the slate. If you had Ryan O'Reilly last night, hat trick, uh, Chabot last night, uh, Ryan Stone's another one, what, two goals, three assists. Uh, you have those types of guys on a three-game slate. You have one of them, or if two of them do it, and you've got both of them, you're very, very quickly going to find yourself deep in the money in a GPP. So it doesn't become, I guess, easier to win them in the sense that all of a sudden anybody can do it, but it becomes easier to do so in the fact that you've got less hurdles to get past. There are less players that are going to have huge games on a slate like tonight. Therefore, if you have the one, you've got as good a shot as anybody. So, And if you don't have him, that's, again, what makes it very, very hard to not only cash in GPP but fall all the way out of the 50-50s and not cash them either. So it's kind of an all-or-nothing type of slate situation. Uh, Three-game slate on this opening page. You come over here to the NHL page, come down to the research station, click on that, and it opens up this page with all of these tabs down here at the bottom. And I will quickly walk you through some of the ones that I use. Um, when I'm looking at the teams that are playing each other, the left team is the away team, the right team is the home team. So this is Pittsburgh at Washington. I can look in here and tell quickly if Pittsburgh is running hot or cold offensively or defensively. Goals for per game, goals against per game. I want a team that's scoring a lot of goals per game. Their road record is very, very high. In, what, six games on the road, they've scored almost five goals per game. They're averaging three and a half. They've, they're not quite getting to three and a half now. That's not much of a significant difference. I don't put much weight into that. I also don't look here at the 4.67 down to the four and put, oh, no, they're cold, because all I see is that 4.67 is unsustainable. They're just coming down to earth. Uh, I look at the goals against, though, and I see that this road record, no goals against, and this is coming up. Again, normalization. Looking at the overall goals against, it hasn't changed a lot you know, in the last 10 games. So no big significant there. It's significant there. It's not like they're running hot. I mean, it's they're cooled off a little bit, which if you read my article uh, out, out on DFSArmy.com, you can use you can find that going to NHL, going to articles, or just clicking on the NHL tab alone, and you'll see that I'm telling you that Pittsburgh's shots on goal are down. This shows you that's not the case, uh, but over their last five games, not over their last 10, it is the case. And that's telling me that they're not shooting as much. They're, or maybe I said their shots were up, but their results were down. Whatever the case may be, there's an indicator in the last five, five games, if you look more recently than the last ten, that Pittsburgh's not exactly running hot. Now, it doesn't matter because Pittsburgh scores a ton of goals, and Washington tends to give them up. If you look at Washington's goals against here, it's high at 3.7. It's real high in the last ten games at almost four. Pittsburgh's still in a pretty good spot against a team that doesn't really care to play defense. Washington also scores a ton of goals. 3.77 on the year is the highest in the league. But over the last 10 days, this is significant. They've come down almost a little more than half a goal per game. That tells me Washington's not exactly firing on all cylinders right now either. I still like the situation. Pittsburgh gives up goals 
Washington gives up goals. It's two high-powered offenses going up against each other. High likelihood of a shootout, hence the 6.5. And, and I'm not going to be using either of these goalies in a game total like this. I scroll down to Nashville. Look at this. All green, all red. That tells me great offense, poor, or I mean, you know, great, good offense, great defense. So that tells me the same thing over here on Colorado. Good defense, good offense. This game could blow up and go six, seven goals, could not do anything and go two to one. What you're going to be looking for here is indicators perhaps that, you know, a team is hot or they've got a hot producing line or something like that. And it's a GPP type of game in that you might take a piece here, a piece there for cash purposes if a guy is hitting value. But don't be shocked when he does because he runs up against a very, very good defense. At the same token, Take a shot stacking a line, and don't be surprised if it blows up and scores three or four goals for you tonight. Very, very hard game to predict in terms of how this is actually going to pan out because it's not a good matchup for either offense. Uh, I'm not on either def uh, goalie in this one either. Uh, personally, I'd be in the goalies down here, Mike Smith and Ryan Miller. And if you read the article, I'm telling you, I'm going to take, if I built 10 lineups, I'd take five on one side, five on the other. I'd get five wins, most likely. And... I, I'd be fine with that because it's a pretty unpredictable slate. Otherwise, you're getting new, uh, Anaheim on a back-to-back. -back. Uh, there it is up here, back-to-back. -back. And you got a low total. Lower totals tend to help us because we don't give up a lot of goals. What I'd like to see is us give up a lot of shots for a goalie. And when I see a bunch of red, it's telling me they do give up a lot of shots against. So Calgary who tends to shoot a lot, tends to give up shots, going up against Anaheim, who tends to shoot a lot, go up against a lot, getting a lot of shots, you know, giving up a lot of shots. This game could be a shot fest, a shot bonanza, but it doesn't look like, based on green goals for and red goals against, green goals for and red goals against, it doesn't look like it's going to wind up with a lot of results. So again, temper expectations, hockey's very volatile. This is one way to quickly look at a slate, start picking your offenses to target. When you pick an offense to target, you're then going to go into the line combos page and you're going to start understanding what these lines mean. The top line is the top scoring line. In Pittsburgh's case, Crosby, Simon, Rust. We come all the way over here. We can see their salaries on FanDuel and DraftKings. We can see their projections if you want to use that as a crutch. Uh, implied scoring percentage, blocks, shooting percentage, shots on goal assists and goals and you see this over the last 10 games as well as the season this gives us a big baseline to draw from and this tells us hot or cold if these are green we're running above our season averages and we're hot if they're red we're running below our season averages and we're pretty cold so that's what we want to be looking for as a general rule when this when this number starts getting up above this number it's a buy signal and when it falls below it it's a sell signal why first of all they're not producing second of all they, the prices go up quickly on uh, DFS sites, and they come down slowly on DFS sites, which means that that price is not adjusting down. So when this guy's raging hot, and then he all of a sudden dips back below his season, his season numbers, and he cools off, he then is overpriced. And same when he rages above his season numbers, he then can be underpriced, and that's the secret to DFS, finding underpriced players in good spots to perform. So if I'm looking at this, situ this situation, I don't mind the top line. Uh, Simon is okay. He's dirt cheap at 4400 on FanDuel. You know, he's pretty cheap on uh, DraftKings as well. He's not a bad one-off. People will play him because the, they look for cheap guys on the top line that get exposure to studs like Sidney Crosby. Personally, I would not play him. I'll show you somebody else here in a little bit. I would be looking at a Latang down here who's running hot. Yes, he's expensive at 6400 and 6100 but he's been producing. Last you know few games, he's been producing. His floor has been high. He's been very steady. I would be looking at him. I'm, again, looking at green on this side compared to green on this side. So, you know, again, green across the board, green across the board up here. Malkin is obviously a high floor player in a great spot. If you ran Latang and Malkin, you would have crisscrossed exposure. Latang is on the first defensive pairing in the second power play unit. See the PP and the line? And Malkin's on the second line in the first power play. They don't share the ice together very often. So they're not going to very often pass it to each other and end up correlating with the goal and the assist. You might avoid that 
you might take that in a, in a cash game scenario because you're getting exposure to different points of the offense, different producers in the offense. However, if you looked, and this is odd, Sidney Crosby's on the power play too. I don't believe that for a second. He's on the top line. He's usually on the power play one. That means that he's on the power play one with Ingvendi Malkin. And when I see that, I guess he's quarterback in the two down here. But when that's the case, I'm going to tend, I'll find a better example for you. Uh, if I jump over here and see these guys on the one, and then down here, these guys on the one. Okay, let's take a look at Washington instead. Talk about that really quick. Top line, top defensive pairing, second line, second defensive pairing. We don't worry much about third and fourth line guys. They don't get a lot of ice time. They're very, very hard to predict. If they get on a hot streak, and occasionally you'll use one as a punt, but most of the time we can just leave them out of our player pool. I'm looking to roster top line and second line guys most of the time. And if I'm running a cash game, I'm going to take a top line guy and a second line guy that both serve on the power play one. Because now I've got, if a goal comes off this line, I've probably got access to it. If a goal comes off this line, I've probably got access to it. And if I get lucky and it comes on the power play, I probably I might have access to both. I might have one who passed it to the other who scored. And I might double dip those points. That's how you're that's more of a GPP thing if you're going to just stack this whole line, one, 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 you know, take these two players because they're sharing, they're on the ice all the time. You're hoping one passes to the other and you double dip those points. On cash games, you can spread out a little bit and you can maybe get lucky by doing it. Another thing that you might do on a cash game is scroll down just a touch. You might take these two guys on the top line. And you might run them since they're on the top line. They're out there all the time at even strength. And then they break apart on the power play. You might do that because if the power play two is the one that does the damage that night, you might get lucky and get access to that goal. And that helps increase your floor. It helps spread you out so you're not quite so focused on one particular event having to happen to make your night. That's, again, fine for GPPs. It's not good for cash games. We can look at the, the implied totals here. And we can see that that's a good game to target, being that they're both green. When I come down here to Nashville, oh, I'll save that for another time. But when we come down here to Nashville, we're looking for the green guys up top. Top line again. Second line has a couple of guys, or the defensive pairing has a couple of guys on it. Uh, Kyle Turris is not a bad play. You can use these at their 5,300 to find some value. You can come over here to Colorado and look at how tightly producing or how tightly clustered their production is. It's all on this top line. And tonight, that's going to be where everybody goes. These guys are on fire. Landskog, Rantanen, and McKinnon are on fire. They are the chalk on almost any slate as a stack. And they will be so tonight on a three-game slate, most likely. What I think, what I think you need to consider is maybe fading that chalk. Because in a GPP scenario you're going to leverage the field in what is otherwise a bad matchup. Nashville is an elite defense right now. They allow the lowest goals against per game, and that puts Colorado in a tough spot. Now, these kids won't surprise me if they blow up for a couple of goals tonight, but nine times out of ten, they're going to produce less than they would in a neutral matchup. And that's what I want to pay attention to because that is what I want to pay attention to the price. They're priced as if they're in a neutral matchup, as if they're elite performers in a neutral matchup. If this production number comes down, this automatically becomes overpriced. And I want to avoid an overpriced situation where I can. And I think it also gives you tremendous leverage over the field that I don't think we'll recognize that tonight and we'll use these guys in tournaments. Can it burn you? Sure. Can it set you up if they are very chalky and they do fail and your guys do perform? Absolutely. And that's the leverage you're looking for to catapult over all of those top-line Colorado guys. And you're looking to get into the money, deep into the money, and capitalize on that failure when everybody was clustered in one area of their rust in their roster construction. If you can get past them all, you can win a tournament that way. And I think tonight's a good situation to do so. Hockey is always a great situation to fade the chalk and because it's such a volatile sport, so up and down, so boom or bust by nature anyway. I mean, really and truly, cash games and uh, cash players don't exist in hockey. 
They just don't. Because the, uh, your studs can score zero, and your third line guys can score twenty. And when the mar when the when the scoring wide is that wide, you just it's a bunch of chaos all over the place. It really becomes who picks who that does well that night. It's a fun game to play. It's a lot of fun to play, but it is hard to predict. And that's why people get frustrated and they go on month long losing streaks and they wonder. I mean, I can go four months out of the six month season and not know if I'm a winner or a loser at the game. I just enjoy playing it. I don't suggest playing hockey for any other reason. I don't suggest you. Well, screw football, screw basketball. I'm going to go pro in hockey. I don't think it exists. But I will tell you, it is a lot of fun to play and a lot of fun to follow along with the game and learn the game through DFS. Uh, scrolling down a little bit more, really quickly, we'll take a look at this game. Here's another highly concentrated offense on the top line in Calgary with a good defenseman backing them all up. There is some value down in here. So you could take a Kachuk on line two, Monahan up on line one. They both overlap on the power play. Throw Giordano in there, and you've got yourself a great high floor stack. I've got access to any goal scored for the most part. I've got players with ceilings, and I've got a decent price compared to what I would pay to get to Colorado. Anaheim, similar situations. You want to watch uh, Rakel here. Aberg has been a good value lately. And then you want to come down in here and probably avoid some of this stuff, other than Silverberg has a tremendous. Uh, ceiling in a lot of cases because he's one of their goal scorers. So the, this is just quickly breaking down the slate. You can come over here to goalies. You can look uh, at our projections. Who's projected high on the night? Who's projected to have the value? Meaning combination of salary and points scored. Who should I be paying attention to? And if you look, Ryan Miller in Anaheim and then Pekka Rene in Nashville. I don't want to test this Colorado uh, offense. Now I might in a GPP because if I'm going to fade them and Nashville wins the game, I double dip because anybody using that top Colorado line will not be using Pecorini. And if Pecorini shuts them out, which he can, or posts a great score, which he can, you really double dip those points because you really put the screws in the guys that used that Colorado top stack. It's a little bit dangerous. That's why it's a GPP play only. But I'm personally going to be running out of that game entirely yeah. using Ryan Miller and Mike Smith. Mike Smith not carrying the value that a Ryan Miller is tops on the slate. So um, I still don't know which one's going to end up doing the scoring. It doesn't look too certain to me that Ryan Miller's just going to run away with it. In fact, I don't think he – I'm not even sure he was the starter today. We'll have to double-check that one. Uh, Anaheim's on that back-to-back, -back, and a lot of times the backup falls in there. But anyway, skater tab, and then we'll wrap it up. Skater tab – shows a ton of stats. It shows our projections. It shows everything broken down. It shows fantasy points, FanDuel, DraftKings, value numbers. If you wanted to just absolutely sort by value and bring the top value guys to the slate, to the top of the, the list, there you go. John Carlson tops on the slate. Latang second. Landeskog, Backstrom, Kuznetsov, Ovechkin, Giordano. This is according to our projections, but you can see a lot of the guys I already mentioned with higher floors in there. You know, the Colorado guys, Latang on defense in Pittsburgh. Carlson gets you access to Kuznetsov and get you access to Ovechkin. This is a top value stack tonight that is sliding under the radar for sure. Now, a lot of people will probably have it, but Kuznov's top-line center, Ovechkin, top-line winger, of course, can break any slate, and then top defenseman in Carlson, that's a stack that you might run. If you ran three, four, five lineups, you might take this stack, and then you might take the uh, Monaghan, Godreau, uh, Giordano stack, and then you might take the Malkin, Latang. Uh, stack, and you might take some other situations and, and, and kind of play with those and then fix, mix and match your second uh, secondary guys around that. And that's another way you can build hockey lineups. These are all things we discuss as VIPs inside DFSArmy.com all the time. Our coaches are phenomenal at helping get guys up to speed. As I scroll over here a little bit more, I'm looking at season-long stats. I'm looking at the last 10 game stats. One thing I love to do is just check who's got the higher floor on the night, I will sort by descending and see who has the highest shots and blocks per game. Actually, I just sorted by defense. I probably would rather sort by by shots as opposed to blocks. I can add the blocks in a situation like Giordano, second highest. We call it a floor because shots and blocks typically happen for the same players. They shoot the puck a lot. They block a lot of shots. You add them together, and you at least know you're in line to score, what, about four 
five and a half. Five and a half times one and a half is about seven or eight. Giordano should get you at least eight points tonight. His floor should be about eight points tonight. If he scores anything else, it's a bonus. When I scroll over here, looking at the consistency numbers, I can see over their last 10 and last 20 games who has consistently hit some of their some of their, their value numbers. I can see that McKinnon, Giordano have scored 10 points, 15 points, 20 points. If I want 20 points out of them, about half the time, not quite half the time out of Giordano, but half the time out of Forsberg. So if I'm looking for some consistency, I might take McKinnon and Forsberg tonight. And then Ovechkin, if I can afford to fit it in my salary, and hope that that consistency pans out tonight. Last 10, there's your uh, there's your rating again. It just it goes on and on and on. You can use the last five to find out who's really hot. Look at who's scored 20 or 30 points. Keep going over to DraftKings, and that roughly shows you the tool, gives you some ideas how to build on the slate. I typically start with my goalie, and then I throw in my top stack. And yes, I stack in cash, but I don't go crazy with it. I try to keep it to two players, maybe one team of three, but I do try to correlate quite a bit. Uh, you can experiment with spreading out. You can experiment with correlating together. It all works just fine. But I like the upside in cash games of being able to target a specific offense and have the majority of the production inside it because that tends to work for me. I can pick offenses better than I can pick players, so I want three or four players inside the offense that does well that night as opposed to trying to be perfectly precise by pick the producer out of this game and the producer out of this game and the producer out of this game and the producer out of this game, of this game with no help backing me up with goals and assists. So that's my style. Uh, Anthony is another one inside the DFS Army that has a he's his style is the one-off style in cash games. Mine is not. We butt heads about that quite a bit, and it doesn't mean we don't like and respect each other's games. It just means that we have a different way of thinking about things and which way is ideal. You can take this this tool also and sort by just want you know the top line and just the second line. So if you want to get guys that are only on the top two lines. You can do it that way, and this will only show you that. Uh, there's just a ton of things to do inside this tool, inside DFSArmy.com. So I encourage you to become a VIP. Jump in here. It's been about 20 minutes. I'm going to bail. Uh, I'm going to go build some lineups. You guys, hopefully you build some lineups and you join us. And I hope to see you inside DFS Army soon where you can get the coaching to really teach you to become a better player, whatever sport it is you play. NFL, NBA, NHL, PGA, college football, college basketball is coming. Uh, soccer, tennis, we, we run it all. When the sports are running, we've got coaches, we've got experts that can help you. Many guys, if you don't believe me, walk up here to our wall of wins, click that, and follow some of those stories, and read what some of them say about the coaching they've received, because it really, really does help your game. Take care, guys. Hope to see you inside. Follow the link in the description of the video to become a VIP if that interests you, and use the coupon code CHOP, C-H-O-P, to save another 10%. While you're down there, hit the like and subscribe button, and I'll keep putting this content out, and ring the notification bell, and you will get access to it every time it drops. So thank you guys for the support. Really appreciate it. Follow me out on Twitter. Come become a member inside DFS Army. Let's talk even more about daily fantasy sports. See you guys.